Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. John in the Wilderness on this last Sunday after Pentecost, Christ the King Sunday. It's great to be with you all today. And especially if you're new or you're visiting, we welcome you. We look forward to connecting with you. There are cards in your pew, and if you fill one of those out and put it in the offering plate, then we will follow up with you very soon. A couple other announcements in terms of visitors. A special welcome to Ethan Durham and Melinda Thompson from Furman University. They're students of Caroline Ulrich there. And we are so glad to have you. You've gotten us off to a great start this morning. Um, also, I'd like to invite Sarah Jurgen to come forward uh, to introduce her to you all. Uh, Sarah is our new Director of Parish Communication and Administration. And uh, she started on the job uh, this week on Monday. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for her to, uh, to just say hi to you all so you can see her. And you'll know who's on the other end of the phone when you call. Hi, um, like Father Josh said, I'm Sarah Jurgen. I'm so honored to be um, here worshiping with you all this morning and um, serving you and helping elevate all this, the ministries of St. John in the wilderness and telling the story of the church. Um, you know where to find me Monday through Friday. Please stop in and say hi. I'm looking forward to learning the name of every single parishioner. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sarah has her membership at a different Episcopal church, so she won't be with us each week, but she'll, uh, she'll be excited to spend time with you all. And, and on Friday, she'll be in the office as well. It'll be uh, 8.30 to, uh, or 9 to 4, Monday to Friday. And on Fridays, just call ahead so that uh, she knows you're coming. Uh, so it's sort of by appointment on that day. Um, we had our vestry meeting on Thursday, just an update on uh, COVID and masking and all that. Uh, the vestry had a really good conversation about it and uh, decided that we were going to continue to wear masks uh, through January and then reevaluated at that point going into the, the Christmas season. Um, nobody was jumping up and down excited to wear masks, uh, but felt like it was the, the responsible thing to do. And, and just appreciate y'all's patience as we go through this together and, uh, and look forward to you know, a time when, when that goes away, hopefully in the not too distant future. Um, we will have our annual meeting on December 5th during our parish breakfast uh, that morning. Uh, I think we can get the documents up for that uh, probably uh, by tomorrow or Tuesday at the latest, uh, so you can check out the reports ahead of time. And, uh, and we'll have a Zoom option as well for folks. Uh, if you're joining us uh, online, uh, you can tune in that way. Um, and so just RSVP for the breakfast, that's the main thing. The link is already up on the website for that, and you'll be able to find it in the email. Uh, we also uh, have formation after this service uh, in the wilderness room. Uh, Mike Cavell will be leading a discussion for adults, high school students, uh, on the church's response to pandemics, uh, now and in the past. And uh, the middle school students will be meeting with uh, Mary Ann Inglis in their classroom. Any other announcements that I'm forgetting? Ah, Angel Tree. Yes. So our Angel Tree project is going great, but we have a lot more kids that, uh, that could really use uh, gifts. So we have these things everywhere this year. There's one in, there's a little tree in each door as you're going out of the church. Uh, and uh, uh, there's also, of course, in the parish hall there. Bring those by December 5th to the parish hall with uh, one roll of unwrapped uh, wrapping paper. And we will get that all going. And thank you guys for participating in that. And please uh, make sure we greet our visitors, uh, uh, Belinda and uh, Ethan and Sarah this morning. Uh, and again, it's wonderful to be with you guys. Uh, why don't we stand as we begin? You'll find the opening hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, in your bulletin. <laughs>
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. pray. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Samuel. These are the last word, words of David. The oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of a man whom God exalted, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the favorite of the strong one of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, one who ru rules over people justly, ruling in the fear of God, is like the light of morning like the sun rising on the cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land. Is not my house like this with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and all my desire? But the godless are all like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with the hand. To touch them, one uses an iron bar or a shaft of a spear, and they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Please read together portions of Psalm 13 found in your bulletin. We will read responsively by whole verse. Lord, remember David and all the hardships he endured. How he swore an oath to the Lord and vowed a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not come under the roof of my house, nor climb up into my bed, 
I will not allow my eyes to sleep, nor let my eyelids slumber. Until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. The ark, we heard it was in Ephratah, we found it in the fields of Jerim. Let us go to God's dwelling place. Let us fall upon our knees before his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. Let your faithful people sing with joy. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your the Lord has sworn an oath to David. In truth, he will not break it. A son, the fruit of your body, will I set upon your throne. If your children keep my covenant and my testimonies, I shall teach them. Their children will sit upon your throne forevermore. A reading from the book of Revelations. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will well. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is co to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
glory to God. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Today we arrive at the end of the church year. I really hate to begin a sermon that way but I'm afraid there's no way around it. It's important that we all know that this Sunday is the last Sunday after Pentecost and that it's commonly called Christ the King or the Reign of Christ Sunday. It is eh, sort of a feast of the church. Again, I hate to begin this way, but it seems necessary to explain the history of this half feast. There is an old saying that when the Roman Catholic Church sneezes, then we Anglicans catch a cold. That seems to be what happened here. The Bishop of Rome in 1925, better known as Pope Pius XI, established the Feast of Christ the King to mark the 1600th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea, whose debate began the formation of the Nicene Creed. The original Feast of Christ the King was to be celebrated on the last Sunday in October which was surely a reaction to an increasingly popular Protestant practice of celebrating the last Sunday of October as Reformation Sunday, since it was on October 31st, 1517, that a a troubled Augustinian monk named Martin nailed his 95 theses to a certain door in Wittenberg, and the Reformation began. But the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, which we use, which which imagines Christians sharing in the rich grace that comes with celebrating the seasons and the feasts and the fasts of the church, does not call today the Feast of Christ the King. In spite of our readings, in spite of that incredible collect we prayed, the prayer book denotes this day as simply the last Sunday after Pentecost. So that leaves us with the question of what to do with Christ the King Sunday. What does it really mean, and what does it require of us, if anything, special at all? Again, I apologize about that lengthy introduction. That's over now. I know I lost half of you when I began with, today we arrive at the beginning, the end of the church year. So tune back in now, okay? (laughs) I know that all of you, like me, often wake up in the middle of the night thinking about our lectionary. Sometimes this lectionary of ours drives me crazy. For example, we have this exchange from John's Gospel today between Jesus and Pontius Pilate. And it's a powerful moment in our story. It's a moment of judgment. This is what it looks like when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords comes face to face, eye to eye, with the kings of this world, with empire with principalities and powers. We get a snapshot of that encounter this morning. What frustrates me is that the lectionary left out the last line of the exchange. Why would they do that? 
The lectionary, you know, this way of reading through the Bible systematically and avoiding your preacher just picking whatever texts are convenient is a good thing. But today our gospel reading ended prematurely with the, with the end of a verse rather than the end of the conversation. We literally have the entire dialogue except for the last six words. So it begins with Pilate asking Jesus, Are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus responds, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my followers would be sending in ground forces on my behalf. They'd be moving an aircraft carrier to the Mediterranean. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would be fighting for me. Pilate asks, so you are a king. Jesus responds, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And period. Our gospel reading ended right there. But there are six more words in the exchange, six more gospel words that we need to hear. When Jesus says, you say that I am a king, for this I was born and for this I came into the world to, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate responds. The text says, Pilate asked him, what is truth? Pilate asked him, what is truth? I've never understood this ending to the conversation because it's a question that just hangs out there awkwardly like something your uncle says at Thanksgiving dinner followed by a trail of silence until someone asks you to pass the sweet potato casserole. Like our reading today, the story would go much better if we just left it out all together and gave Jesus the last word, not Pilate. It's hard for me to imagine what Pilate was thinking when he asked the question, what is truth? What was his tone like? Was it dismissive as he tired of the back and forth with Jesus? Was it a condescending, what is truth? Was it an honest inquiry, what is truth? that Jesus just ignored? It seems so incomplete to me, like the editor of this gospel had crossed it out and then added it back again, and then crossed it out and added it back again as any unsure writer has done before. I think it must have come from a place of despair. Pilate being pulled in many directions says to Jesus, Tell me, what is truth anyway? I think there was despair in his voice. And we can relate to despair like that. How many times have we asked this question when we followed the false kings of this world only to realize that they were in it for themselves, that they wanted to burn our energy for the fires of their cause? They told us that we deserved to live in luxury in the wealthiest nation on the planet. And that if we bought enough nice things, then we would have enough and, and be enough. But it wasn't true. And we're left at the checkout counter, shopping basket full, asking a cashier, what is truth? They told us and we believed that the workload and the busyness would lessen if we just did a little bit more, if we just worked a little bit harder. We can see an opening a few weeks from now when we'll get a break and we can catch our breath. But we're so tired now. We're so spent now. We find ourselves driving to another event, another soccer practice, another appointment. And when we get to this appointment or to, to that function, we pull in and, and find a parking spot and we're left staring at a, a row of cars asking, what is truth? The pundits on Fox News and CNN are angry, anxious, and afraid, but we can't turn it off. They told us that things would get better if our guy won, if our party was in charge. They told us that those other people were idiots and we can't let them have power. What about the judges they'll pick? What about your health care? But you just voted how they told you 
and you're still unsure, all you can think about as you put the I voted sticker on is the question, what is truth? I'd like to know. Would you like to know what is truth? I know that I would. Let's circle back to how we started this thing, because even if this feast is the new kid on the block, it taps into something, into someone who is older and brighter than the stars. Today we arrive at the end of the church year. In our worship, we, like Pilate, come face to face this day, eye to eye, with Christ the King. In our gospel reading today, we thought that it was Jesus on trial. But actually it was us. Us and our world. And honestly, that is good news if you care about truth. All of the loyalties of this past year, all of the times that we made monarchs of, of false kings and bent our knees to them, they are all here before the Alpha and the Omega, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and today we leave them behind for the truth of the eternal reign of Christ. We are being judged this day by the God who knows all too well our idolatry and loves us anyway. Now, I know that divine judgment brings up all kinds of fear-filled images of apocalyptic end times, but in the Bible, divine judgment confronts us with truth, something people of faith welcome and yearn for. It brings to light the sham, the duplicity, the lies and injustice that riddle nations and wrecks them. And it exposes the secrets of our hearts so that we might be purified. What is truth? At least Pilate was asking the right guy. The truth is that we are here we are the church because Christ is our King. He showed up proclaiming the eternal reign of God being at hand. He is a King whose law is love, whose territory is as big as the cosmos and as local as our hearts. He is a King whose soldiers beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, whose church is a visible sacrament of his reign, because we were dead, but now we are alive. We were lost, but now we are found. Will you make him your king? Will you be a citizen of his kingdom? It requires us to lay down our loyalty to self, to political party and country, and to redefine family. Our world is so divided and enslaved by sin, and we're a part of that. We contribute to that. If you want out of that division, if you need liberation, then step into the reign of Christ, and you will meet the truth. And he will set you free. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. 
Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love, and be found without fault at the day of your coming. And for the mission of the Church, that as faithful witness we may preach to the gospel, to the ends of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease and that all may be one as you and the Father are one. For those who do not yet believe and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Jose, our bishop, for Josh, our rector, for Sandy, our deacon, for our vestry and staff, and for the ministry of each of us. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. For those in positions of public trust, especially Joe, our president, and Roy, our governor, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, For all who live and work in this community, for a blessing upon all human labor, and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our enemies and those who wish us harm, and for all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, for those who are present and for those who are absent, for our families, friends, and neighbors, we pray for Chuck, Vanessa, Joanne, Tom, Eleanor, Tripp, Susie and Rosie, Catherine, Lois, Dave and Nancy, Christy, Mary, Mackenzie, Joanne, Helen, Diana, Mary, Anne, Herb, Alex, John, Sandy, and Barbara. Are there others? that being free from anxiety and sickness, they may live in joy, peace, and health. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the community of your church, 
We remember Michael Redman, whose service is this week. And those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the ever blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Saint John, and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To, to you, you, O Lord our God. For yours is the majesty of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our name. <coughs> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in the thoughts or in the deed, by what you have done and by what you have left undone. We have not looked in your whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Reveal your truth and sorrow and come on the ground. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace be Peacefully. Peace. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs>
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be pleased. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
With whom will you share this communion? Pat's Redeemer, Beverly Creeley. In the name of this congregation, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We, we who are many are one body, because we share one bread. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and sinless of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.